Hello and welcome to the fifth webinar in this series presented by Optimized Thermal Systems. The topic of this webinar is transitioning to alternative refrigerants and implications for heat exchanger design. This is a live webinar. Thank you all for joining us today and we'll do our best to keep the session to about one hour. The presentation itself will be about 45 minutes and we'll reserve 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Please submit your questions via chat and we'll do our best to answer those questions for you. Okay, let's get started. The material today has been prepared by myself, Darren Key of Optimized Thermal Systems and by Dennis Masuda, also of OTS. This has been done in conjunction with the Copper Development Association. Our contact info is listed here and will be listed again at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to reach out with any questions you might have about the material presented here today or upcoming or past webinars or you know, any general inquiries you might have. All right, here's the, uh, the contents of today's presentation. Uh, I'll do a brief introduction of the webinar series itself, and then we'll discuss the background of alternative refrigerants, looking at the motivation of moving to a new set of refrigerants, as well as putting that transition to some uh, historical and uh, also uh, big picture context. Uh, then we'll take a look at the policies driving these changes, and um, then I'll hand it off to Dennis for some comments on the heat exchanger design process, different things to keep in mind. Um, and then he'll guide us through a few case studies and take a closer look at heat exchanger design and system level impacts for uh, some of the new possibilities with these new refrigerants. Um, I'd also like to note that these case studies will focus on copper tube thin heat exchangers, which are currently the uh, dominant technology in the market. Okay, uh, introduction. Uh, so as I said, this is the fifth webinar in this particular series. There are, uh, sorry, the previous four are listed here uh, and can be found on the OTS website. Uh, webinar one is a really great resource for understanding the fundamental uh, and the benefits of smaller diameter tube fan heat exchangers. Webinar two discusses the construction methods and equipment that's used in the manufacturing of tube fan heat exchangers. And the third webinar discusses Coil Designer, which is uh, a heat exchanger design software that's distributed by OTS, and it's a really powerful tool for heat exchanger design and optimization. And you'll actually see some Coil Designer output during Dennis's case study portion of the presentation. and. Uh, you know, if you're in the business of heat exchanger design, um, this, is a, this is a great tool to have to uh, shorten your heat exchanger design life cycle and um, uh, definitely send some inquiries about that if you have any questions. And finally, later this year, we'll have uh, one more webinar that we'll be releasing, webinar six, which will discuss uh, the impacts of frost on heat exchanger design. Okay, if you made it this far, presumably you're familiar with tube fan heat exchangers and the role of the refrigerant. But just to make sure you're in the right place, on the left, we have a copper tube fan heat exchanger. Uh, the very basic components are the tubes and the fins. Tubes are connected to each other with U-bends and the heat transfer surface is extended by the fins. Through those tubes flows a working fluid, which is known as a, as a refrigerant. And that's the topic of today's webinar. Shown here is a copper tube and aluminum fin assembly, which is fairly typical. And over on the right are some refrigerant canisters. It's you know hard to find a picture of, of refrigerants, so you know, canisters. So it looks like we have R134A, R22, and R404A, all of which are expected to see significant phase downs over the upcoming years due to new GWP limits. Here's another slide that we like to show that helps us keep in mind uh, the big picture when it comes to uh, not only heat exchanger design, uh, but also refrigerant selection in this case. So as we'll see, most of the changes that we'll be discussing here today uh, for new refrigerants is being driven by the green leg over here, the environment and safety leg. Uh, 
specifically with respect to direct refrigerant emissions. But we also need to keep energy efficiency in mind uh, and cost. So wherever possible, when changing refrigerants, we really want to maintain energy efficiency or even improve it when we can. Um, that is possible in certain cases. And we want to keep cost down as much as possible as well. So Dennis will be keeping these three factors in mind during the design process and case study portion of the presentation. All right, motivation. So why do we want to change refrigerants? And if you've been in the industry for any period of time, why do we want to change refrigerants again? So I think, again, it's helpful to have the big picture in mind. And the name of the game here, what this is really all about is avoiding global temperature increase. And of course, you know, all the all the risks related to human health, economic impacts, food security, water supply, I could go on, um, that are associated with uh, global temperature increase. Um, that's, that's the name of the game here. And unfortunately, uh, Refrigerants have definitely played their their role in uh, contributing to part of the problem, but that also means that we're a, a significant opportunity. And uh, I think this graphic is useful. This is something that probably most of us have seen. Um, this is from the IPCC report and shows this first column here is 1.5 C of uh, global temperature rise increase over a pre-industrial baseline. In the middle, a 2.0 C increase, and then like. I think is really helpful is this this last column here, which is the delta between the two. So this represents um, you know 0.5 C of say temperature global temperature increase uh, avoidance would be one way to look at it. And that that is in fact exactly what the Kigali Amendment. We'll get into that in a bit. That's exactly what the Kigali Amendment is attempting to do. It's to avoid a half a degree of global temperature increase. Uh, I'll pass it over to, to Dennis for this um, as a, a little bit of commentary on how we might want to update our thinking on the role of refrigerants uh, in our in our industry. Uh, Dennis? Yeah, so I wanted to kind of quickly address what I have kind of seen in the industry as a you know, common perspective, and that is that we, we often hear that um, you know, refrigerants are not really the central focus, they're a secondary thing. We don't need to worry about refrigerants as much as we do. Uh, need to worry about indirect emissions. Uh, in other words, the amount of emissions that are consumed because our equipment uh, consumes electricity, which produces greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and this is true. We have you know really significant emissions coming from uh, energy consumption, electricity consumption of HVAC equipment. Um, but this distinction that refrigerants don't matter, I want to challenge that and say that that's sort of an outdated stance. We we heard this kind of uh, narrative come forward, I think, in maybe like the late 90s and early 2000s when we started doing life cycle climate performance calculations and TEWI calculations of the total life cycle impacts of HVAC equipment. And at the time, the grid was you know really dirty, so to speak. Um, we had a lot higher CO2 emissions for a given amount of electricity generation. So when you looked at the total impacts of an HVAC system, almost all of it was coming from energy generation, energy consumption, and a smaller piece was coming from direct emissions of the refrigerant leaking into the atmosphere during its life or at the end of life. When we look at the figure on the bottom left, we see how energy generation, electricity generation in the U.S. has increased, uh, but then began to sort of stabilize as efficiency measures um, improved. Um, but if we look at the CO2 emissions in blue below that, this really tracked with electricity generation for a while, um, but in the sort of mid 2000s really drastically dropped off. And a lot of that had to do with uh, increase in natural gas uh, power plants, taking, you know, uh, replacing coal plants and the increase in renewables. And if we look over to the right, we see projections out to the future from NREL in terms of the power sector emissions going all the way out to 2050. I think the bottom line is that emissions from energy consumption are going to decline significantly. And when we look at a HVAC system today and in the future, um, the emissions of refrigerant itself is something we can no longer really ignore. So this is just to put it in real simple kind of back of the envelope calculation numbers. Here's an example, three ton air conditioner, say it has about four kilograms of 410A in it. Um, and that refrigerant leaks uh, over the lifetime of the equipment. And has a GWP here of uh, almost 2,000, depending on which uh, you know IPCC report we're going off of. Uh, but that's 2,000 
uh, kilograms, the equivalent of 2,000 kilograms of, of carbon dioxide for every one kilogram of uh, 410A that's leaked. And if this system's used kind of you know, conservatively within the U.S., about 1,000 cooling hours a year, we would see in 1990 that um, about 80% of the, the annual impact, the environmental impact of this system uh, was coming from the indirect emissions from electricity consumption and only 20% coming from uh, direct emissions. If this was in a you know southern state being used a lot more, you would see that uh, effect even, th that difference even starker. You would see maybe 90% um, indirect emissions and 10% direct emissions if this was used, say, 2,000 cooling hours a year. But when we look at the present value, we see you know already a significant decrease in the uh, uh, emissions from electricity consumption of, of this system in 2020 uh, compared to the numbers we might have gotten used to in the late 90s or early 2000s. And when we look forward, uh, this 2050 column is showing the uh, sort of reference case, the mid case from NREL for uh, electricity emissions of, of a system. And so the, the point of this is to demonstrate that as the grid gets cleaner, as electricity produces less carbon dioxide, if we stick with the same refrigerants, um, it's really going to shine a light on how uh, how significant those direct emissions impacts are, and they become you know can become a, a really uh, significant force in the environmental impacts of these systems. So we're getting to the point where we can no longer uh, ignore the the high GWP refrigerants we're using today. We need to move to lower GWP alternatives. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. And to to draw that out even a bit farther. Um, this is uh, from a report uh, from between the NREL and Oak Ridge, um, sort of looking at just just air conditioning uh, market growth over the next 40 or so years. And for you know, there's an expect there's there's a lot of growth expected um, in non OECD countries. That's all all the gray countries here. Uh, there's a 4.5x projected increase in uh, just air conditioning. So just just one sector of the market and a 1.3x increase for the OECD countries. Um, so we expect the, the industry to grow a lot. And you know this is a sort of a business as usual um, pie chart here. We can see the bulk of the refrigerants that are currently used are fluorocarbons, but specifically uh, HFCs. So um, pretty high global, uh, global warming potential uh, refrigerants currently being used. So. And then combine that with, you know, there's a lot of electrification efforts going on in, um, you know, different states, different countries around the world, um, which means more, more heat pumps, more heat pump water heaters. So um, there's a lot of VCC systems that are going to be coming online in the, in the upcoming years. And, you know, if we use business as usual technologies uh, for this transition, um, we don't win. So we need to do something. Uh, and hence alternative refrigerants. Um, uh, uh, and I want to kind of provide a modern definition of what we mean when we say alternative refrigerants. Um, you know, if you look at the historical context of, um, of, uh, of the refrigerant industry, there's been sort of like four main transitions uh, uh, into refrigerants. And it's a lot of good information uh, online about this. Um, but the, the main takeaway here is that there's sort of a cycle of uh, you know new new technology, um, environmental and safety concerns that are developed around that new technology and industry and policy work to address those concerns, and then uh, a new technology is developed and implemented. Um, so, like I said, it's happened probably about four times, depending on how you parse it up. Um, and uh, so when we talk about modern refrigerants or alternative refrigerants today, uh, we need to be a bit more specific about what we mean. And these days it means uh, HFOs, uh, some hydrocarbons, some natural refrigerants, you know, all depending on the application. So, so here's that cycle that I just described. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we've already kind of addressed the environment and safety concerns here. Um, in the next few slides, I'll be addressing some of the, the policy uh, industry and policy concerns uh, or, or how we're proposing to, uh, to address those concerns. And then uh, Dennis's portion uh, is going to focus on uh, the new technology uh, and development adoption. So, um, again, uh, what I really want to emphasize is that we're this transition is you know, nothing that the industry hasn't seen before. Um, we actually have a 
pretty great track record of uh, addressing these types of concerns and uh, coming up with the implementable solution and, and making it happen quickly. So uh, some, some good track record there. So uh, here's, a, here's what I'm proposing as a, a modern definition of alternative refrigerants. Um, uh, you know, toxicity, that's been on the list uh, since, the, since the early days of the refrigerant industry. Um, and generally, we want toxicity to be low. Of course, depends on the application. You know, if we have an industrial refrigeration warehouse where there are no people or very few number of people, we might have a higher tolerance for toxicity. Um, but in general, lower is better, of course. Um, ozone depletion, that needs to be zero or as close to zero as possible. And that's certainly achievable and it has been achievable for a long time now. Um, flammability, again, similar to toxicity, lower is better, but um, depends on the application. And there's been a, some advancements in that, especially for uh, residential applications. And then GWP, uh, we want that to be low. Um, it's in quotes because once again, like everything in engineering depends on the application. Um, I'll get into that in a bit, in a few more slides. Um, and then of course, uh, the thermophysical properties have to be useful. So it has to have a, a useful working range. So that's what we're looking for when we say a modern alternative refrigerant. Okay, let's dig a bit into the policy. Um, if you're confused on the policy, that's probably a good thing um, because there's been a lot of changes, a couple of changes this week, actually. Um, so uh, I think it makes sense when talking about refrigerant policy to start at, at the international level, um, specifically with the Kigali Amendment. So the Kigali Amendment um, is part of the Montreal Protocol. Um, and uh, the, the goal of the Kigali Amendment signed uh, in 2016 uh, is to avoid 0.5C of warming by the end of this century. And it proposes to do that by phasing down HFC use. Um, over the next 15 or so years. Uh, that's sort of the overarching goal here. Um, the, the key there, this is a phase down, not a phase out. So the original uh, Montreal Protocol was a phase out of um, ozone depleting chemicals. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a phase down. So if there are certain applications that can only be achieved with uh, you know, current technologies, uh, there's an argument to be made for that. But the targets are aggressive, and so in a lot of cases, this will mean a, a phase out, but that's not written into the legislation. Uh, then zooming in a bit to uh, the United States level, um, in late December, uh, there was the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act that was passed. Um, and, uh, you know, the main takeaway there is there's, you know, the orange line is Kigali Amendment, the blue line is AIM, so you can see very quickly AIM aligns perfectly with the uh, Kigali Amendment. So perhaps a bit late to the party, but um, back on track here pretty quick um, in the next year or so. And the, the main authority that uh, AIM gives is it gives EPA the actual authority, uh, that authority had been disputed, but um, gives the EPA actual authority to phase down uh, HFCs. Um, and actually, uh, earlier this week on Tuesday, April 13th, um, EIA, NRDC, and a few other uh, environmental groups officially petitioned the EPA to, to start using this authority. Um, and specifically, they're asking for EPA to uh, reinstate SNAP rules 20 and 21, a bit more on that on the next slide. They're also asking uh, the EPA to adopt some of California's HFC rules. So uh, yeah, it, it's, it's been a confusing landscape um, in the United States at least, um, and hopefully that's starting to come a bit more into focus um, quickly. So a bit more information on uh, SNAP. So specifically rules 20 and 21, um, they are set to phase, uh, they set a phase down schedule uh, for use of high GWP refrigerants. So it's important to keep in mind that things like uh, Kigali and AIM um, provide the targets of uh, where we want to go, but they don't provide specifics on how to actually achieve that. So it's left up to, well, 
Previously, it was left up to the to the states to achieve that, but now, hopefully, uh, with the EPA's newfound regulatory power, um, uh, the EPA can can provide the guidance of how we're actually going to achieve what's laid out in in AIM. Um, and then, uh, with respect to oh, also, I want to uh, uh, briefly discuss um, SNAP Rule 23. So uh, that's a proposed rule uh, hasn't gone into effect yet to my knowledge um, and the goal there is to allow the use of A2L refrigerants those are uh, mildly flammable refrigerants in air conditioning applications so that opens the door for uh, you know a handful of refrigerants useful AHF, HFO refrigerants uh, and others um, for air conditioning applications which is you know will help us meet some of those GWP targets. Uh, and then, you know, as I mentioned, that that um, petition that was filed earlier this week also uh, is encouraging the EPA to adopt some of uh, California's guidelines. Um, and this is a this is a look at um, some of the some of what they're talking about. So specifically, uh, they have a CARB in California has GWP limits set for uh, different end uses. Um, so that you know what I was saying low GWP in quotes, uh, this is kind of what I'm talking about. So like for example, chillers, depending on the uh, temperature range of the chillers, um, there's different GWP limits that are acceptable. Um, same goes for refrigeration, um, whether it's new facility or existing facility, um, you can see a pretty wide spread for new facilities, GWP of 150 uh, up to for existing facilities, uh, 2200. So pretty big spread there, um, uh, and you know this is showing what year, at least in California, it's proposed for uh, those those limits to co to come into place. So um, the legislation in the United States is starting to come into focus a bit more, um, and there'll be lots more lots more to be had on that in the upcoming weeks and months, I'm sure. Okay, now I'm going to hand it off to Dennis for uh, some more specifics on uh, design process and uh, some case studies. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, so as Darren said, we're starting to kind of sharpen the point on what um, uh, refrigerant GWP levels are going to be deemed acceptable. And this is sort of something everybody has been holding their breath for um, in, in designing new systems or redesigning their systems because we need to know what level is acceptable or what refrigerants are acceptable for us to start designing around. And I want to talk through uh, in these slides that really just still at a very high level, what are sort of the driving forces um, behind those uh, those transitions and what can we do about um, you know the, the challenges that are arise. So kind of trying to break out in a simplified manner what are the what are the things that we have to deal with when a new refrigerant comes into play when we need to replace our uh, existing refrigerant with one of these alternatives that should hopefully have lower GWP. And I don't intend for this to be totally exhaustive, but I think these are three of the kind of big categories that we, we focus on. Um, the first most important one that we're inevitably going to encounter is different thermophysical properties of, of the new refrigerant. And what I think is one of the bigger factors there is, is differences in heat capacity. Um, so to kind of demonstrate that over on the left here, you can see our pH diagram of a couple of refrigerants, 410A, R32, 1234YF, for example. You can see that like these higher pressure refrigerants, they have higher heat capacities, higher um, thermal capacitance. The vapor dome is wider, so the enthalpy difference across uh, the evaporation or condensation phase of, of refrigerants is, is bigger. Um, that, that means that if we go to a refrigerant that has a wider vapor dome, has more heat capacity, um, we can get the same cooling capacity or heating capacity um, but while also reducing the refrigerant mass flow rate. But if we go in the other direction to a, system, to a new refrigerant that has lower uh, heat capacity, lower thermal capacitance, um, we have a narrower vapor dome and we end up needing to increase the refrigerant mass flow rate to um, uh, to achieve the, the target cooling capacity or heating capacity we want to reach. And this is pretty much always going to happen. No two refrigerants are going to give us exactly the same set of properties. So when we have to make this transition, this is what we're primarily interested in um, paying attention to. So that can work out, like I said, in a good direction. You may have a higher heat capacity. You're moving to a more efficient uh, fluid, 
um, and we'll talk about that. And that's usually good news. That means we can improve efficiency or increase capacity. It also means we could reduce cost if we need to. We could maybe make a smaller heat exchanger um, and reduce some uh, reduce some material, save some cost to kind of offset the uh, inconvenience of having to, to do this transition to a new refrigerant. It can also go in the other direction. We may have to replace with a lower uh, lower performing refrigerant. Um, and then sort of a cascade of other effects is going to happen. And if you've worked through the design process, if you've seen this kind of happen before your eyes, um, you'll try to increase the refrigerant mass flow rate to reach the target capacity. That's going to lead to higher uh, uh, pressure drop across the circuits. And you're going to have to work to mitigate that, either putting in larger diameter tubes or increasing the number of circuits. Um, to to keep the refrigerant pressure drops in your heat exchanger at an acceptable level. And then inevitably, once you've done that, you'll end up reducing the mass flux inside of your tubes, reducing heat transfer performance. You have to do something else to compensate. And we'll talk through some of the options that you have to um, to do that. And the story is pretty much the same with flammability and toxicity. Um, when we want to deal with one of these challenges, either of these, usually the the solution is to try to reduce the amount of refrigerant that we have, um, especially when it comes to flammability. There are charge limitations in um, you know, some uh, product certifications and, and building codes that we need to consider. We'll often have to design something to minimize the amount of uh, flammable or toxic refrigerant that's, that's being used. So we can do that by putting in smaller tubes, less tubes, shortening them, changing the internal volume of the heat exchanger, essentially. And when we you know, make that change, of course, there's going to be um, again, a kind of cascade of other changes to both the heat exchanger and the system um, performance that, that we need to work to design around. You can go on to the next one. So here's sort of the knobs that we have to turn when we're trying to deal with this, uh, this cascading effect of, um, uh, of design challenges. Um, all the way on the left here, um, we're often going to need more circuits um, when we go to designs that have smaller tubes or we have uh, a higher mass flow rate of refrigerant required. And this usually isn't a, a major issue. We, we have to de design around this when we go to small diameter tubes anyway. Um, a lot of designs are moving in this direction of having more circuits, uh, but it does introduce more labor to braze those, uh, those joints, maybe more materials. And it raises some concerns about refrigerant distribution. We need to pay extra attention to make sure we have uniform refrigerant flow through all of our circuits, especially in an evaporator where we've got two phase entering the distributor. Um, we've got some other options though when, we, uh, when we've when we added those circuits in and maybe we've lost a little bit of performance with a certain design, um, we're going to want to increase uh, heat transfer performance. We can do that you know, kind of the simplest way, adding more fins, more material to the heat exchanger. Um, and this is, this is you know, often a good option uh, when we just need to get a little bit more performance out. Adds a little bit of material cost, but of course there are scenarios where we can't do this. Maybe your fan can't handle the added pressure drop um, or the, the fan power increase is too high. Um, maybe the fins are already too close together um, or, or very near that point. Uh, and so you have issues with condensate or frost and maybe that's off the table. Um, we can look at longer tubes or adding more tubes to the heat exchanger, making a bigger heat exchanger essentially. This adds material, um, but it also has other impacts downstream. Um, it's going to impact the tooling the, uh, for, for your enclosure. You're, you know, the, the cabinet that holds your heat exchanger may now need to change in height, and that's, that's going to uh, frustrate a whole bunch of other engineers in another department uh, when you have to uh, change, change the entire um, you know, layout of, of, of your product because the heat exchanger need to increase in size. So this is you know, one of the tools we have in our toolbox, uh, but all of these we kind of want to consider to use, like consider them sparingly. Um, and then our bottom two options here are kind of tied together, which is going to small diameter tubes and employing enhanced fins. We've done a lot of discussion on this. I would kind of refer everyone back to the uh, previous webinars where we looked at small diameter enhanced uh, tube, uh, tube fin heat exchangers. But this is one of the nicer tools available to us because when we go from a larger diameter tube to a smaller one, uh, we're able to get greater convective performance, better, better heat transfer performance out of the heat exchanger. And we're usually able to do that in a smaller space. We have, we have better compactness. So rather than affecting our cabinet design, our enclosure design, we're able to put more tubes into the same space. And because those tubes are a smaller diameter and have thinner walls, we usually end up also saving material. So this is a you know a nice option for 
dealing with these transitions. Of course, it makes the issue with uh, circuiting uh, these challenges potentially become, uh, you know, the, it brings this challenge to the forefront. Um, and of course, the other challenge is with tooling. We don't already have the tooling to build uh, small diameter tubes uh, or, or tube fin heat exchangers. Then there's a, a capital cost associated with that if we're building heat exchangers in house. Um, of course, not an issue if we're, if we're buying heat exchangers externally. So I'll go into a couple of case studies here. And really, again, these are just kind of demonstrative and, and, and staying at a, at a pretty high level. Um, in our first case study, we're looking at the flammability case where we have a, a product where we need to reduce um, the charge of a flammable refrigerant. This is all written up in a Purdue conference paper that we had written, so I'll, I'll refer you to that if, if you want to see some more details on this. This this was a project done between the Copper Development Association and or I, they uh, yeah and um, and Sub Zero, uh, looking at a domestic refrigerator. And in this design challenge, we're trying to implement uh, the flammable A3 uh, flammable uh, refrigerant isobutane in a in a refrigeration condenser. And the issue is uh, there are limitations to the amount of charge we can put into that system. And the current heat exchanger had too much internal volume. It required too much refrigerant charge. So the paper here documents a lot of uh, work that went into uh, sort of full design optimization of um, new heat exchangers that would reduce the amount of internal volume. We looked at different tube diameters, different uh, fin geometries, spacing between the tubes, spacing between the fins. And we used our coil designer software along with an optimization algorithm to simulate thousands of different designs of heat exchangers and find those that um, had optimum performance. The Pareto front here shown in the figure shows sort of our best designs in terms of those who minimized internal volume and those that minimized airside pressure drop. And um, these are these are sort of the, the best balance. We can either reduce internal volume quite a bit uh, at the expense of higher air pressure drop, um, or we can uh, make lesser reductions to internal volume with comparable airside pressure drop to the baseline. But it ends up being actually a very convenient, easy solution to test. Uh, was to just retain the original dimensions of the heat exchanger. And, and the table at the bottom right is sort of the, the final parameters of a design that we prototyped and tested. Um, this is uh, taking essentially all the, the dimensions of the original coil and just simply replacing the tubes from 6.5 millimeters with five millimeter diameter tubes, uh, but all other dimensions the same. And in this next slide, uh, we can see the uh, prototypes that were built uh, again, looking you know, very similar, same dimensions, just going to a smaller diameter. Um, so these were these were these were built up and they were tested. Uh, the figure on the right shows some calorimeter data showing the UA, the, the conductance of this heat exchanger against um, the, the baseline existing heat exchanger, and it performed essentially the same, a little bit better um, than than the uh, than the baseline heat exchanger but at the same time was able to significantly reduce the internal volume. You can just think of that simply rather than going to going through all the measurements and, and, and details, you can see very simply, like if we go down just in diameter from a 5.5 millimeter to a 4.5 millimeter inner diameter, we'll see a 33% reduction in volume. And in this case, that was enough to kind of push us over the edge to be into the safe um, acceptable limit of refrigerant charge for this flammable fluid. So this is you know, what, you know simple, simple, simple example of uh, how you design around a uh, flammability limit. Every case is, is kind of going to vary some. You may be close to the limit. You may be far from the limit. And the extent to which you need to modify the design will will vary. Um, but the, the bottom line is that uh, we need to reduce internal volume. And when we do that, we often need to make some other changes to make sure that we haven't affected any other parts of the system, air pressure drop, refrigerant pressure drop, and so on. So in our next two examples, we're going to talk about uh, sort of a very basic residential air conditioner uh, sample. And in this first case, we're talking about what I think most of us are looking at in, in sort of the air conditioning heat pumping space is sort of a near-term transition uh, going from 410A to something like R32. This is just an example. We could consider this to be 454B or other uh, high pressure refrigerants that are um, you know, considered as replacements for 410A. But this one, for example, has a GWP of 677, 
which falls underneath that 750 limit that Darren mentioned um, being considered by CARB, being implemented by CARB. And so this is sort of our, uh, you know, likely near-term replacement scenario for um, residential light commercial air conditioning and, and heat pumping. Um, some characteristics about the system, pretty conventional, seven millimeter outdoor coil, three eighths inch uh, indoor coil. And in the table below, we're showing uh, simulation results from our vape psych software coupled with uh, coil designer simulations of the uh, refrigerant to air heat exchangers. And these are at the, like the normal rating condition, the 95F ambient. Uh, HRIA condition. So the top row shows our 410A cycle as a 10.5 kilowatt cooling capacity, about a four COP. And if we simply drop R32 in a system like that, because of the higher uh, thermal capacitance, the higher heat capacity of the refrigerant uh, compared to um, 410A, as we saw in the pH diagram earlier, um, we end up with a boosted capacity. We have about 10% more capacity, a little bit more COP out of the uh, R32 than 410A. And so a replacement like this will typically also be paired with a uh, reduced uh, displacement volume in the compressor. Here in the third line, we go to about 10% less uh, displacement volume in the compressor. And in that case, we're able to match the cooling capacity, 10.5 kilowatts. Um, and we uh, also you know, receive the added benefit of higher uh, COP from the, uh, from the cycle because we're running uh, less refrigerant through the um, lower refrigerant mass flow rate through the heat exchangers. The heat exchangers are essentially oversized compared to what they would be for 410A. So we end up with um, a higher COP than the baseline. So this is great news. Um, there are a lot of refrigerants like this in the near term that we're going to be able to kind of make drop-in replacements with pretty minimal uh, impacts on the system. The, you know, the question many of us will ask when we have a design like this is also, well, what if I do some more optimization of my system um, because I've exceeded the, the targets I set out to achieve? How much could I save in terms of material cost if I were to um, optimize for this new refrigerant that has, happens to have a little bit better efficiency? So in this next slide, um, kind of look at some of the options that we have. And this is, again, sort of a reiteration of the, the knobs that we have available to turn. We can do some things, we can remove tubes, we can shorten the tubes, uh, we can go to smaller diameter tubes or we can reduce our fin density. These are all measures we can use to make our heat exchanger smaller since it's, it's bigger than we need it to be um, and save us some cost. Each of these is gonna have a different impact on cost. You know, removing tubes is uh, you know, your biggest way to reduce cost because the copper tubes are, are the most expensive part of the heat exchanger. Um, and each is gonna have different impacts on maybe changing the uh, enclosure design and uh, increasing or decreasing airside pressure drop or refrigerant pressure drop. So as we make changes, um, we need to keep in mind all of these other um, ramifications that it has. Um, so the table below shows just some very simple, you know, non-optimized basic design options that we could put in uh, as a replacement. The first, um, which is shown in the third line, second to the last line, is just shortening the heat exchanger, keeping that outdoor coil, but reducing the tube length, reducing the fin density because that heat exchanger is overperforming. And what you can see is we were able to basically drop the COP down, match the COP of the baseline, but we were able to save about 15% mass on the heat exchanger. Now there's other, obviously other ramifications there. We end up with a shorter coil and that may change um, some details of our enclosure. And there's a whole, you know, variety of different designs we could consider here that might reduce mass more or, um, you know, balance mass, COP, and capacity in a way that um, suits your needs better. But this is just kind of an example of, of what can be done. We can also go to an even smaller diameter tube coil. Um, the example on the bottom uses five millimeter coils, the five millimeter tubes. And in this case, we, you know, reduce the number of tubes, reduce the fin density, reduce the coil height. And we're able to come up with a design that actually has half of the mass of the baseline, half of the heat exchanger mass of the baseline. That's made up primarily by um, the reduced depth of the five millimeter tubes. So the fin depth is, is smaller in the air, air direction. Uh, so we have a lot less fin material and the tube thickness is, is less, the tube material is less per length. So we have really significant um, heat exchanger uh, material savings. 
in this example, um, we take the penalty of going to a higher air pressure drop, higher fan power, um, and in doing so, end up actually with a, a still having a higher COP and a lot of heat exchanger um, material savings. So these are just you know two exi two designs that exist in sort of a near infinite space of, of designs you could consider, um, but they demonstrate how if you have a refrigerant that's performing better than um, your what you're replacing, you have some flexibility to optimize the design further. So in our next slide, we talk about just sort of like what happens next. Darren talked about the 750 GWP limit that is you know soon to come, um, but that that limit is likely not going to bring us all the way to the end of this. There will very likely be as as we look at uh, AIM and SNAP and Kigali, there's a desire to get much much lower in terms of uh, the emissions from these uh, from these refrigerants or the amount of refrigerants that are being produced and emitted. Um, and so we'll likely need to see another transition further uh, uh, further down the line that goes to a lower GWP limit. What that limit is, I think, is not um, certain at this point. I think you see numbers being thrown around that might be in the you know 100, 200, 300 range. Um, in this case, I'm just going to kind of show a you know, straw man example here of what happens if it's 1234 OIF. Not a refrigerant that you would normally see in a re residential air conditioner. It's you know, more your automotive refrigerant. Um, but I want to kind of show the extreme case of very, very different refrigerant properties and, and um, what trend, what direction does that le lead things in. Um, so this is obviously a very low GWP refrigerant, medium pressure refrigerant um, getting replaced for a, a high pressure uh, 410A. Um, it's an unlikely uh, candidate, but there are refrigerants like this in nature that would have, uh, say, lower lower pressure levels or lower uh, heat capacity that may need to be considered long term if we go down to a GWP limit that's much much lower than um, than 750. So, in this case, we're looking at the opposite behavior where we where we um, have lower heat capacity of refrigerant, lower pressure refrigerant. Uh, being substituted. In the second to last line, you can see if you just drop that refrigerant into your cycle, you'd end up taking a huge penalty to, to cooling capacity. Cooling capacity would go down to five by about half. Um, and, and that's because of the, you know, the very different properties of, of this refrigerant than 410A. So when you do a replacement like this, you're obviously also looking at replacing the compressor. In this case, the compressor needs to go up by about 150% in displacement volume. And when we do that, we get the cooling capacity that we want. But the issue we encounter is that our COP drops off. We're no longer hitting our efficiency targets. Um, and it can be much worse than this. This is kind of a you know not too bad news uh, type of scenario. So in the next slide, we kind of start to see why this is happening. Um, why did our COP go off? Well, it's because the refrigerant pressure drop inside the heat exchangers increased significantly. And that's because we had to have so much more mass flow rate of refrigerant going through to meet, meet the same capacity. So what can we what can we do to deal with this? Well, the first thing is we need to get rid of that refrigerant pressure drop. We need to do something or reduce the the pressure drop. And the evaporator is the most critical point. Both of them obviously should be addressed. Sometimes the condenser has a little bit more um, capacity to handle um, increased refrigerant pressure drop. But first thing is we need to uh, reduce the the pressure the pressure drop in these heat exchangers. We have more than two degrees saturation temperature drop from the inlet to the outlet, um, and that's kind of the design rule of thumb we would keep in mind to, to try to um, you know, stay below. So we'll first need to reduce pressure drop and then if we lose performance we'll need to do something to compensate um, in terms of uh, heat transfer performance. So again just a couple of examples here in this next slide of um, what could be done. These are you know just rudimentary uh, guesses of what, what we could uh, what we could implement in the second row. Um, we add more circuits uh, to the heat exchanger. So you can see on the left is our outdoor coil um, going to uh, you know more circuits, less tubes per, per circuit. And on the bottom is our you know a, just a, a a chunk of our evaporator. There's obviously more tubes below this, um, going from four circuits up to six or seven in this case. So we have to increase circuits quite a bit to bring the pressure drop down. And you can see if you follow that second row to the right that. Uh, the evaporator pressure drop, condenser pressure drop, they went down quite a bit. They were at like 300% before now. Now they're more in an acceptable range. Um, but we still have COP uh, coming in a little bit lower than we want. 
And that's happening if you look at the evaporating temperature and condensing temperature, TE and TC, the evaporating temperature is below our baseline, the condensing temperature is above our baseline, our compressor has to do more work um, and uh, we wanna try to you know, avoid that. So we can do this in any number of ways. We could increase fins, we could increase tubes, we could put in enhanced fins, all of the uh, design options that we discussed earlier. In this case, just a simple example, we threw on two more tubes on the just the outdoor coil that reduced the condensing temperature just a little bit and our COP came uh, came in line with uh, with the baseline. So uh, there is this sort of quick and dirty um, design work that we can do to um, work through these different conditions and find a solution that's that's going to meet all of our design targets. But you can see that you know just manually doing this, guessing one parameter after the other, and then seeing the consequences, it it can be a really time consuming process. So having the software obviously much, much faster than having to build and test and go to the lab and, and interpret results every single time we wanna look at a new circuiting or a new heat exchanger design. Um, the software allows us to quickly test these hypotheses, but then even better is to do sort of full optimization and what we can do and we've shown in, in our past webinars and, and other papers is that we can take this software and we can automate the whole process of generating these different options and do a full optimization where um, we, allow each one of these variables to change different tube diameters different fin densities um, different tube lengths and tube and fin types and allow the computer to simulate those thousands of options and give us the best one um, that has you know the right balance for our unique combination of uh, requirements for efficiency and cost and so on so that sort of brings us to the end of the design section and the end of the webinar um, just to sort of wrap up um, I'm going to kind of bring it back to the beginning here and say that, um, you know, we have a big challenge here in front of us, but it's one that um, the industry has uh, has faced and come out, come through you know, a number of times before. We have all of the tools available to us to, um, to work through this at this time. And now that we're seeing more clarity on the policy front, um, we have a little bit clearer picture of what are the targets we need to hit so we can just start designing our, our, heat, ex our heat exchangers and our systems around them. Um, this narrative that refrigerants are not important and energy consumption, electricity consumption is the only thing that matter. It's outdated and it continues to be, you know, it, it gets even more wrong as, as we speak, as the grid gets, um, you know, low, as the grid decarbonizes, um, we see that uh, electricity impacts of these systems will get lower, but the refrigerant impacts will remain the same unless we replace refrigerants with uh, lower GWP alternatives. And we have some good alternatives available. We can bring GWP down from, you know, sometimes more than 2,000 uh, to close to one. Um, so each one of these alternatives is going to present different challenges to us, and each product that we consider may have different challenges um, built into it, depending on what what the application is and what the current design looks like rel relative to some optimum. Um, but there are, hopefully, this this presentation kind of gives you some guidelines for how you can design a system around what we think are these sort of main categories of, of design challenge and how software um, simulation and optimization kind of help you get to the point of uh, using just the heat exchanger uh, redesign as a way to adapt sort of the entire system to these changing uh, new alternative refrigerants. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dennis. Um, uh, before we open it up to Q and A, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items here. Um, OTS is presenting at Purdue conference the week of May 24th, uh, presenting a paper a design optimization of three and five millimeter copper tube fin heat exchangers, uh, also with uh, experimental validations. Um, and then uh, the final webinar of, of this series uh, will be coming out in June in a few months. Um, and we'll be looking at what happens when you put some of those smaller diameter tube fin heat exchangers uh, in a frosting situation, what happens and what you need to look at. Um, and uh, with that, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, I'd like to open it up now to, uh, to some questions. And, uh, take over here <laughs> yeah great we've got a couple of questions that have come in first of all there are a few questions asking about past webinars as well as this recording 
and we will be making that available afterwards. You should receive an email, much like you did for the webinar login details for today, and we'll make sure we put links in both for this presentation as well as for some of our past webinars. For questions, um, there are a couple that came in in regards to the case study two that you shared. The first question is uh, specifically about R32. We know that R32 is uh, an HFC, and while it has a lower GWP, it's still a relatively high GWP. So wondering if you could just uh, comment a little bit about how soon you think we may have to phase out R32. How long is it an option for us? Should we be using R32 while other alternatives are in development or potentially skip it altogether and go to non-HFC refrigerants? Well, I think you picked a super loaded question for us. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't know that I, I, I can um, I can say definitively. I don't have the crystal ball on on what the what the next limit will look like. And and of course that'll also depend on the application. You may see you know a, a market like air conditioning moving faster than um, you know, refrigeration towards certain levels, or you may see the opposite of that. Um, I don't I don't think I have a, a clear answer on that, but you know, judging by the pace, there's definitely, um, you know, there will be years of use of 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 the refrigerants that may may be implemented at the like below 750 threshold. Um, whether or not that makes sense for your particular product or business, I think really comes down to uh, kind of how close you are to a solution using something. And I want to be kind of agnostic to the specific refrigerant, whether that's R32 or something else at that high pressure level. Um, you need, you may be in a good position to do that very easily and quickly, um, whereas changes to a, a further out refrigerant may, um, you know, they may take more time. They may may require more significant changes to your um, uh, your compressor or other components of the system, um, or, or um, you know, may just take some time to settle out and, and decide on which which refrigerant is really going to end up coming to the forefront as um, as fitting in that that category. I think we don't even know yet at this point if that target is going to be 150 or 200 or what that GWP limit will be um, and, and what industry is going to settle on in terms of that next refrigerant. So I think there will be folks who, um, you know, get some some good mileage out of another uh, high pressure refrigerant like um, like R32 um, for, for the years to come. Um, and there may also be folks out there who um, benefit from just going straight to a, a much much lower GWP solution if, if they've done the uh, the engineering design work to get to get there. Um, so sorry, that's not a not a direct answer, not really um, a clear answer to the question. But I think we're still kind of at a point where um, we don't have complete clarity on what that next level of uh, policy will look like. All right. Yeah. yeah just just to just add another thought to that. You know, there's. As I mentioned, um, there's new uh, regulations going into effect, uh, you know, regularly these days. Um, and you know, I, I kind of alluded to it, but the A2L mildly flammable refrigerants will likely become available for certain applications um, in the United States. Maybe the tolerance for um, you know, varying levels of flammability and toxicity will will go up, and that will open up to more refrigerants. But you know, it's a moving target, so it's tough to say. <laughs> All right. This next question is also on uh, case study two, and this slide, and maybe the next one are good ones to be on. Um, did you keep the same system subcooling and superheat? And if not, how are those defined in this analysis? Yeah, these are both using the same subcooling and superheat. And right, there's there's an argument that maybe that R32 cycle would see a lower superheat to try to keep uh, discharge temperature down. And, and there, there may be some other differences, but just for the sake of kind of your simplest cycle comparison, we're talking about uh, five degree subcooling superheat for all cycles here, just to keep everything clean. And on the previous slide, slide 25, can you clarify if this pressure drop is for air or refrigerant side? Yeah, this is air side pressure drop. And there's a question as to why we would focus so much on the air side pressure drop and um, 
asking if the refrigerant side isn't more important for the cycle. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, in this case, you know, there was little sensitivity to air side pressure drop. Um, the blower could essentially handle more um, more pressure drop than the, uh, the design began with. But usually, when especially when we look at like new uh, heat transfer surfaces, new fins, smaller diameter tubes, um, we're often really concerned with this ratio of like. Uh, J to F or like you know heat transfer to air side pressure drop. We want to make sure we're we're talking in equivalent terms. If if we end up with a design that's uh, you know twice as much refrigerant or sorry air side pressure drop and and performs better, that's you know that's obvious. But um, we're paying a price for that, so we want to make sure we're not paying an an, uh, uh, an unexpected price in in terms of uh, fan power. It also means you know in a lot of cases not just that you're going to see more fan power, but you're going to end up with um, much lower airflow rate through the heat exchanger and you may end up seeing uh, performance loss that you, you miss. If you're just doing your modeling in, in coil designer or you're just doing your testing in a wind tunnel, um, you, you can often miss these effects of like ending up with a lot less um, airflow rate when you have higher air pressure drops. So we're, we're trying to keep everything equal so we have no uh, impact from the fan. And you're right, so in this case, we're going to smaller diameter tubes means we have more refrigerant on uh, more pressure drop on the refrigerant side. In this case, this pressure drop is is quite small. The heat exchanger is very small. And because it's a condenser, the system can tolerate a fair amount of, of pressure drop. So in this case, you know, we, we don't see a uh, big degradation in cycle efficiency. Um, but uh, of course that's that's gonna vary from one one product to another. Great. There was also a question about uh, replacements for our 410A, and it's possible that some of those will have noticeable temperature glide. Can you talk a little bit about how that's going to impact heat exchanger design or emphasize some points we made today? Yeah, and and um, this is a this is a good question. I mean, and temperature glide is is a is a really important um, parameter. I think most uh refrigerants that are, are kind of coming to the forefront and being considered as replacements for refrigerants that don't have glide today uh those alternatives are are we're targeting refrigerants that are low glide or no, next to no glide um so you know the hope is we're not having to do too much designing around that but of course there are plenty of applications where there will be a lot of glide um, we didn't talk about um any um we didn't talk about this in, in great detail in these in these results. It didn't end up being a, a major factor in, in, in performance. R32 is a pure fluid, um, but um, it's it's something that absolutely should be considered. Um, one of the big pieces of this transition uh, to a significantly different refrigerant is, and especially a transition to smaller diameter tubes is uh, the consideration of, of circuiting. We, we're probably going to need to recircuit re our heat exchanger when we make these changes. And, and glide is um, another one of these parameters where the circuitry makes a big difference. Um, lessening refrigerant pressure drop can be helpful. Designing our circuitry to the, the flow direction of our circuitry to sort of uh, match glide to air temperature change can be a way to actually um, make positive use of glide. Um, and I, I, yeah, it's hard to kind of make a general comment there other than uh, it's, it's really important to simulate these, these things and, and have a software that can capture the, uh, the effect of glide and uh, allow you to evaluate different circuitries and, and different designs that can um, you know, tolerate that. Great, thank you. Well, I see we're at our time. There were a few more questions. We've captured those and we'll write up some responses and we can submit that when we uh, share all of the webinar materials today. Darren, did you have anything else in closing? I just wanted to thank everybody for joining and uh, yeah, submit those additional questions if you have them and uh, poke around on our website, take a look at some of those previous webinars and uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us.